In this week's weekly funny story jokes, we bring you our best funny story joke compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you five story jokes, starting with a story about a donkey, until we finish with a hilarious story about a, a guy with an earring. Please watch to the end, as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach aches. In our first funny story of the week, we bring you a tale about a donkey, or a jackass as they are called. Ever wondered how to handle unsolicited advice from the back of a donkey? Hang on to your reins because in today's funny story joke, Orville Ornery O'Sullivan and his witty sidekick, Beatrice, take you on a journey where critics meet comedy in the most unexpected ways. Orville Ornery O'Sullivan shuffled down the dusty road, his weathered face creased with a scowl that could curdle milk. Beside him clopped a scrawny donkey named Beatrice, her ears permanently pricked in a state of perpetual suspicion. Perched precariously on Beatrice's bony back was Orville's eight-year-old grandson, Timmy, bouncing like a particularly enthusiastic beanbag chair. Grandpa. Timmy piped up, his voice high-pitched and cheerful. Don't you think it's kind of weird for me to be riding and you to be walking? You look like a grasshopper with a sprained ankle. Orville grunted. It's the only way your scrawny shins won't rub blisters the size of dinner plates on Beatrice's bony hide, you little rapscallion. Just then, a shiny carriage pulled by two well-fed horses approached, kicking up a dust cloud that momentarily obscured the road. Inside, a portly woman with a feather boa the size of a boa constrictor squinted at them. For shame. She huffed, her voice dripping with faux concern. The poor old man trudging along while the child sits pretty. What a disgrace. Orville choked back a retort about her carriage's resemblance to a gilded outhouse and mumbled something about fresh air being good for the soul. Timmy, however, wasn't one for subtlety. Hey, lady. He yelled, waving a fist. It's my grandpa and my donkey, and we can ride or walk however we darn well please. The carriage sped on leaving behind a cloud of dust and Orville with a throbbing vein in his forehead. Grumbling under his breath about uppity city folk, he helped Timmy swap places. They continued, Timmy waddling uncomfortably beside Beatrice while Orville enjoyed the surprisingly comfortable donkey ride. He hadn't realized how much his knees ached until that moment, but their newfound peace was shattered by a group of rowdy cowboys approaching. The leader, a man with a handlebar mustache that would make a walrus jealous eyed them with amusement. Well, howdy there, partner. You sure got a mighty fine-looking donkey there. You wouldn't happen to be mistreating that poor little fellow, would you? He gestured to Timmy, who scowled back with all the fierceness an eight-year-old could muster. He ain't mistreating nobody. Timmy protested. I just gotta walk because he gets back pains if we both ride. The cowboys burst into laughter, hoots echoing across the prairie. Orville, feeling his cheeks burn with embarrassment, decided to take action. All right, all right, that's enough. He barked, dismounting Beatrice. Timmy, hop on. They continued, both perched atop the now slightly disgruntled donkey. It wasn't the most comfortable ride, Beatrice's bony spine digging into their nether regions with alarming regularity. But at least they weren't being judged, right? Wrong. As they traversed a bustling market town, a group of elderly women gathered outside a bakery, their eyes sharp as tacks under their frilly hats. Oh, the cruelty. Gasped one, her voice tight with manufactured outrage. Two grown men piling on top of that poor creature. It's a disgrace. Chimed in another, clutching a loaf of bread like a weapon. Don't they have any shame? Orville, at his wit's end, threw his hands up in the air. Look, ladies. He bellowed, 
We tried walking, we tried one at a time, but nothing seems to please you. What do you want us to do? A thoughtful silence descended upon the group. Finally, the first woman spoke. Well, you could always just carry the donkey. She said with a sly smile. Before Orville could respond with a string of expletives that would make a sailor blush, Timmy piped up, a mischievous glint in his eye. That's a great idea. Come on, Grandpa, let's give it a shot. And so, Orville found himself with Beatrice draped limply over his shoulder, her hooves dangling precariously close to his head. Timmy, perched precariously on Beatrice's belly, giggled with glee. The townsfolk stared, then burst into laughter. Just as Orville was about to unleash the full fury of his vocabulary, they reached the bridge. The rickety wooden structure groaned under their combined weight, and with a yelp that would make a coyote proud, Orville stumbled. Beatrice, sensing freedom, bolted, dragging Orville with her. They crashed into the railing, sending Beatrice tumbling over the edge and into the murky water below and drowned. A splash. Silence. The moral of the story? If you try to please everyone, you might as well kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> Our second funny story of the day is a classic story of Red Riding Hood, like it's never been told before. In today's funny story, we bring an epic story like it's never been told before. You might have heard many funny stories about Little Red Riding Hood, but this one has never been told before. As Farmer Jack will be the first to tell this funny story, we want you to sit back and enjoy the ride or enjoy the walk for that matter. So, Little Red Riding Hood was walking through the forest with her little basket. She was very happy and was singing as far as she went. However, as she went deeper and deeper into the forest, the forest became darker, and she started to hear funny noises. She was clearly concerned for her safety, as she had been told before, about the big bad wolf lurking in the forest. However, she kept singing the same old song. She spotted a movement and could see that something was hiding behind a tree. She stopped and asked, Is that you, Mr. Big Bad Wolf, hiding behind that tree? The wolf came out of his hiding and with a sleeky look on his face said, Yes, it's me, Little Red Riding Hood, and where might you be heading? I bet you are on your way to your old granny, living all alone in the forest, aren't you? Now the big bad wolf has been planning to go and eat old granny for some time, but was waiting for Little Red Riding Hood to visit granny. He could then have two meals for the effort of one. He, however, was very surprised to learn that Little Red Riding Hood was not on her way to granny. So where are you going then? Asks the wolf. Little Red Riding Hood said, I am on my way to visit my cousin Mary, and she is not afraid of any big bad wolves. And where were you going? Asks Little Red Riding Hood. The big bad wolf, still very confused, as he knows these woods so well, and had heard about cousin Mary, but had never visited her area before, lied and spoke. No Little Red Riding Hood, you will be safe going to your cousin because I am going to visit the three little piggies." The wolf then left. As Little Red Riding Hood walks further through the forest, singing her same old song, the wolf followed her. He was thinking that if he can trap Little Red Riding Hood and her cousin Mary together, then he can still have two meals for the effort of one. Close to her cousin Mary's house, Little Red Riding Hood again hears something in the forest behind a tree, and again she stops to ask. Is that you, Mr. Big Bad Wolf, hiding behind that tree? The wolf again appeared and spoke. Yes, it's me, Little Red Riding Hood. Seems like the three little piggies stay close to your cousin Mary. But I promise you, you will arrive safely at your cousin Mary, as I am going to visit the three little piggies. Little Red Riding Hood then continue the road to her cousin Mary, singing the same old song. Once she arrived at her cousin Mary's house, she was amazed by how beautiful the place was. The house was on a cliff, and the scenery was magic. They were still busy packing Little Red Riding Hood's basket out, when suddenly, 
the big bad wolf appeared. He was growling, and it was clear to the two of them that this wolf meant business. The wolf charged, and Little Red Riding Hood and her cousin Mary ran the only way they could. The big bad wolf now had them cornered, and they were standing on the edge of the cliff. They had no way to go. Now, said the big bad wolf, you can jump over the cliff and fall yourself to death, and I will eat you, or you can come into the house with me, and I will still eat you. The big bad wolf was now very brave. Unfortunately, he forgot some minor details. The next moment, the big bad wolf got a heavy thump in his back, and he flew over the cliff. On his way down to his death, he was thinking, What on dear earth have just happened? Then it struck him. The same old song that Little Red Riding Hood was singing while walking through the forest was the answer. He started crying as he sang the song. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Our next funny story bring you a bride-to-be that have a big problem to solve in order to have her day to be perfect. It's a story of jealousy. Buckle up, folks, because this is a wedding story wilder than a runaway bouquet toss. With a jealousy between two women more loaded than a high school science project gone terribly wrong. So, picture this. Jennifer, positively glowing with pre-wedding bliss. Her dress is perfect, the venue's booked, and even the caterer hasn't messed up the canapes, yet. The only cloud on this sunshine-filled horizon? Her parents' recent very public divorce. Think, Geraldo Rivera throws a microphone at a restraining order, but Jennifer, bless her optimistic soul, is determined to have a picture-perfect wedding. Now, some scientists say jealousy is more common in men, fueled by some primal urge to protect their mates. Others say it's a woman thing, driven by a need for emotional security. But let me tell you, in the case of Jennifer's wedding, this jealousy was a double threat, a two-woman tango of teal and trouble. You see, science tells us that jealousy is like a funky smoke detector in our brains. It goes off when it perceives a threat, like someone trying to steal your parking spot, your favorite pen, or in this case, the spotlight at your daughter's wedding. Enter her mom, a woman who could turn a trip to the grocery store into a fashion show. She finds this dress, a vision of emerald green that practically screams most stylish mother of the bride ever. Jennifer does a happy dance, relieved that at least one wedding detail won't be a disaster. Fast forward a week, Jennifer's scrolling through Instagram when a picture stops her cold. It's her dad, beaming next to a woman who looks like Barbie after a Botox bender. And what's Barbie wearing? The exact same emerald dress. Turns out, Dad's new, much younger wife, Bethany, has the same exquisite taste in gowns and questionable life choices as Jennifer's mom. Panic sets in. Jennifer calls Bethany, begging her to choose another dress. Honey. Bethany purrs in a voice smoother than butter on a hot day. This dress makes me look like a million bucks. And let's be honest, it's not like your mom invented green, is it? Jennifer wants to scream but settles for a face plant into a very unwedding-y pillow. Jennifer relays the disaster to her mom, bracing for fireworks. But to her surprise, her mom just smiles serenely. Don't worry, sweetie, she says, patting Jennifer's hand. I'll find another dress. After all, it's your special day. A wave of relief washes over Jennifer. Mom's a lifesaver. They hit the shops, and guess what? They find another stunning dress, this one a sapphire blue that knocks Jennifer's socks off. Crisis averted. Exhausted but triumphant, they celebrate with lunch. Jennifer, feeling peckish and relieved, can't resist asking, So, are you going to return the green dress? You won't have another occasion to wear it, right? Her mom takes a sip of tea, eyes twinkling. Oh, honey, she says with a sly grin. Of course I do. Jennifer leans in, 
eager to hear about some fancy charity gala her mom has lined up. Her mom leans in closer, voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. I'm wearing it to the wedding rehearsal dinner. <laughs> In our second last funny story, we bring you Cinderella at the age of 75, getting a second chance. In today's funny story joke, we find Cinderella rocking a life way past her prime with wishes wilder than a bachelorette party in Vegas and a cat with more side eye than a disapproving grandma. Get ready to laugh because this fairy godmother throws a curveball that'll leave you snorting like a startled pug. Cinderella, at a sprightly 75, wasn't exactly rocking the ball scene anymore. In her rocking chair, that is. Perched on her porch, with her ever-judgmental cat Alan as company, she surveyed the world with the wisdom of a woman who'd seen it all. From pumpkin carriages to snoring princes, let's not forget the snoring, life with the dearly departed prince had been an adventure. Deep down though, a tiny part of her couldn't help but wonder what it would have been like to have a partner who was, well, perfect. Someone who shared her love of cozy evenings and never left the toilet seat up. One fine afternoon, brighter than a rogue disco ball in a retirement home, the fairy godmother shimmered into existence. Alan, ever the fan of personal space, arched his back like a furry question mark. Cinderella. The fairy godmother boomed, her voice still packing the same theatrical punch. After a life well lived, you deserve a little something extra. Three wishes, to be precise. Cinderella blinked. Three wishes at 75? Now that was a retirement plan she hadn't considered. Well... She began, stroking her chin thoughtfully. Money would be nice. Like, obscenely nice. Poof! Her rocking chair transformed into a solid gold monstrosity. Alan, ever practical, let out a yowl that could rival a fire alarm and bolted to the edge of the porch, his claws digging frantic furrows into the wood. Oh, thank you ever so much. Cinderella squeaked, perched precariously on the now uncomfortably warm gold. No worries, dearie. Onwards to wish number two. What's your heart's deepest desire? The fairy godmother chirped. Cinderella gazed down at her creaky knees and sighed. Youth, I suppose. A touch of the old razzle-dazzle wouldn't hurt. In a flash of sparkles, Cinderella was back to her youthful self. Wrinkles vanished, replaced by a dewy glow that could launch a thousand tabloids. A forgotten flutter stirred in her chest, a long dormant yearning for something beyond bingo nights. Excellent choice. One wish left. Don't hold back. The fairy godmother beamed. Cinderella glanced at Alan, who was now sporting the kind of deer-in-headlights expression that only comes with facing a magical makeover. Alan, her loyal companion since kittenhood, had always been there. Through thick and thin, through snoring princes and endless cups of chamomile tea, he'd been a constant source of purrs and non-judgmental companionship. Maybe, she thought, the perfect partner wasn't someone flawless, but someone who knew you, flaws and all, and loved you anyway. But the yearning for that what if was still there. Make Alan here. She declared, the words tumbling out before she could stop them. A handsome young man, a real looker. Alan let out a pathetic meow, his fur puffing out in protest. But wishes are wishes, and with a snap of the fairy godmother's diamond-encrusted fingers, Alan transformed. He stood tall, a vision of sculpted perfection, with eyes that could melt glaciers and a smile brighter than a dentist's convention. Birds overcome by sheer handsomeness, began plummeting from the sky like feathered confetti. There you go, Cinderella. The fairy godmother cackled with delight before vanishing in a puff of glitter that smelled suspiciously like mothballs. For a beat, silence reigned. Then, 
Alan and a very youthful Cinderella stared at each other, the air thick with unspoken, well, everything. Cinderella, breathless, took in the masterpiece before her, every rom-com cliché embodied in one perfectly sculpted human being. Alan, for his part, looked like he was about to faint, or maybe file a lawsuit. He sauntered over, his every step oozing an aura of misplaced confidence. Cinderella, still frozen on her golden throne, found herself unable to tear her gaze away. Leaning in close, Alan whispered into her ear, his voice a husky purr. You know, Cinderella, he murmured, his breath tickling her newly youthful cheek. I bet you're regretting that whole neutering thing right about now. In our last funny story of the day, we bring you a funny story about a guy that pitch at work with an earring. But before we go, we would like to thank you for watching our funny story compilation of the week. If you've enjoyed our video, then please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. This way, you will be notified about any releases from us. Thank you so much. Here we go with our last funny story of the day. In today's funny story joke, we venture into the everyday chaos of Bob's life that is a so-called a nervous breakdown trapped in a human body. Grab your popcorn because we're about to witness a fashion crisis messier than Bob's attempts to match socks on a Monday morning. Trust us, it's an uproarious comedy of errors in his wardrobe. Picture a man so uptight his tie could be a ruler and his stress level rivals a stapler on the fritz. But wait, a glimmer of rebellion shines brighter than the soul-sucking fluorescent lights, an earring on Bob's ear. Bob, a man as rigid as a stapler, sat hunched over his computer in a beige cubicle. The fluorescent lights buzzed, mirroring his constant tension. His crisp white shirt, ironed that morning, wrinkles were blasphemy, stood at attention beneath a tie perfectly aligned. Behind him, the company dress code hung like a judge, highlighted in his red pen. A glint of silver caught Harry's eye, a diamond earring on Bob's ear. This was a fashion rebellion in the heart of conformity. Whoa, Bob, what's with the earring? Harry asks, eyes wide in shock. Bob mumbles. Uh, it's not a big deal, just an accessory. Yes, an accessory. A mischievous glint sparked in Harry's eyes as he scooted closer. Bob, company policy and excessive jewelry. Remember the time Marsha wore that scarf that could be seen from space? You, the company code of conduct maniac, made her believe we practically needed sunglasses indoors. You're braver than I thought. He wheezed, barely containing a laugh. Different. This is a, a bold whisper of rebellion. Very subtle. Definitely within company regulations, we need to express ourselves, you know. His voice, however, lacked the usual conviction, betraying the panic rising in his chest. Harry, a man whose sense of humor usually resided somewhere between a damp sock and a tax audit, did a comedic spit take, worthy of a stand-up routine, enjoying his friend so-called seemed to be misery. Papers fluttered around him like startled pigeons as he tried and failed to stifle a laugh that threatened to morph into a full-blown hyena impersonation. Wiping a tear from his eye, he wheezed. Whoa, Bob, what's with the earring? Flustered Bob protests. A pirate look? It's not a pirate look. It's sophisticated. And it hasn't been long. Just a few days. Flashback. The aroma of greasy goodness filled the air as Bob, a man who planned his lunch breaks with the precision of a brain surgeon, indulged in his once-a-month cheat meal. A double cheeseburger with extra everything from his favorite, and only slightly questionable, takeout joint. Leaning over to grab a napkin from the passenger seat, a sound like a tiny anvil hitting the floor shattered the blissful silence. There, 
nestled amongst stray French fries and questionable burger remnants, lay a single diamond earring glinting accusingly under the dim truck light. Bob stared at it, his mind conjuring images of disapproving glances from his wife and a scathing memo from HR about unidentified foreign objects in company vehicles. Present. The color drained from Bob's face faster than you could say dress code violation. The earring, once a source of mild curiosity for his co-worker, now felt like a ticking time bomb strapped to his earlobe. Bob whispers. Uh, actually, it's been since my wife found it in my truck. If you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.